and I'll be your host today. Before we begin, a bit of housekeeping, a quick disclaimer that the information presented during this event is not medical advice, nor is it intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always please seek the advice of a physician or other qualified health provider with questions concerning a medical condition. On behalf of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, welcome everyone to our 39th virtual forum, Non-Infectious Complications of Primary Immunodeficiency. To our return attendees, it is so great to see you again. And for our new participants, we are so glad you're here and hope you will join us again. Our forums are designed for you and by you. Based on the feedback that you give us, the topics you request to learn more about, and through your support and participation, we are able to provide these forums to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Now, as you can see from our mission, IDF is dedicated to fostering a com community empowered by education. We want you to remember that IDF is committed to our community, serving you as a trusted resource through the use of technology and innovation. We are here to give you the tools and information to become empowered. At IDF, we value integrity and inclusion and offer to you our compassion, understanding, and support to emphasize that you are not alone on your journey. We are all in this together every single step of the way. We are very, very fortunate to offer these forums and additional events to our community due to the support of our sponsors. It is because of their partnerships and contributions that IDF is able to offer programs and services so that everyone can be better informed. Our sponsors include core service leaders, CSL Bering, Griffles, and Takeda, core services supporter, Octopharma, core service sustainer, Horizon Therapeutics, core service contributor, Ledient Biosciences and ADMA Biologics, national sustainer, Acredo, National Patrons, Diplomat Specialty Infusion, Kedrion Biopharma, CVS Specialty, Quorum, CVS Specialty Infusion Services, Karoo Medical Systems, Kava Fusion, and Saleo Health. Many of our sponsors have plasma donation centers, and we encourage you to visit their website for more information on how you and your family members and friends can make a difference. At this time, I would like to invite Marjorie Pering from CSL Bearing for a few words. Thanks, Kathy. Hi, everyone. My name is Margie, and I am down in the Tampa, Florida area. I represent CSL Bearing. I have their IVIG, which is Privagen, and their subcutaneous product, Hyzentra. And I look forward to seeing everyone in the breakout rooms later on this evening. And I look forward to the event. It sounds like a great evening. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Margie. Next, I would like to invite Christine Lachinsky from Griffles for a quick word from our sponsor. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Christine Lachinsky. I am the specialty IG sales representative in the Los Angeles area. It's great to see everybody. Um, Lots going on in the world, so I'm feeling especially grateful to the IDF for providing this platform to share information with patients. Um, at Griffles, we do put the patients first, and me personally, I think of all of you and your stories and all my interactions with customers, and my favorite stories are always when patients are doing well on an IV, IG or a sub-Q product, no matter what product it is or company, so that's just me. I'm happy to hear that you all have options. And join us later in the Griffles room. We ha do have a new copay program, $10,000 copay assistance program that I can tell you more about in, in the chat room. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Christine. And we do look forward to hearing more from, from you and from all our sponsors during the virtual exhibit hall today. Now, I would like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Hannah Niebuhr 
Dr. Niebuhr is an assistant professor in the Division of Pediatric Allergy and Immunology at the University of, University of Nebraska College of Medicine and sees patients at Children's Hospital and Medical Center in Omaha. Please welcome Dr. Niebuhr as she presents the session, Non-Infectious Complications of Primary Immunodeficiency. Can everyone hear me? Yes. All right, thank you to the IDF for having me. I'm very excited to get to talk about this with everyone today. Because this is a really difficult topic. Normally, when we talk about immune deficiency, we think about infections, and there is a lot of different things that can happen. So in the normal immune system, there are three big things that happen. So the first is defense against infections. So the immune system has to figure out when there is an invader, when there is some kind of a pathogen. And there's a lot of different kinds of infections out there viruses, bacteria, parasites, fungus, that all has different parts of the immune system that can recognize it. In addition to that, you know, if we think of it as not so much, hey, there's an infection, the immune system has to recognize it. It's also this idea of that your immune system has to understand what's in your own body, what is my cell, and what is not my cell. And that goes into cancer su surveillance. So as cells in the body change and mutate, they stop looking like our own cells. They start looking like something else. And our immune system is constantly checking our body to look for cells that are showing that they're no longer normal, that they're no longer our self, and eliminates those cells as they present. And the third thing the immune system has to do is know when enough is enough. When we get sick, our immune system revs up, we get fevers, you know, our lymph nodes get big, we get tired, our blood counts are, go up. But when the infection goes away, all of that has to come back down. We have to achieve balance again. And the immune system is important, it has to regulate itself. So it has its own system of checks and balances to know when to go and when to stop. All right, so what happens when the immune system is out of balance, out of proportion? So when the immune system is a little bit low, we get problems with infections. In addition to that, we can get some other odd things that happen that we're gonna talk more about like granulomas. But the immune system is also really important for wound healing. So we also have trouble healing our cuts and our scrapes and our bruises. But you know, sometimes as part of that, it's not only that the immune system isn't acting enough, it's not acting enough sometimes in the right places and overacting in the wrong places. And when that happens, we get those mutations in cells that aren't controlled and we get cancer. Or the immune system starts getting confused and you know, instead of attacking the infections, it starts attacking our own body. And that's when we get autoimmune disease. Or we get allergy where the immune system decides that those pollens really are very dangerous and need to be dealt with. So let's start with lung disease because this is really one of the most common non-infectious places we see immune deficiency. And it you know, affects about 70% of patients with immune deficiency. But what lung disease is, you know, can take a lot of different forms. And the big three types I'd like to talk about this evening are asthma, bronchiectasis, and interstitial lung disease. And we're going to go through those one by one. But the big thing I would say about lung disease is the symptoms can happen really slowly over time. But once they start, they tend to be progressive. So these are things where, you know, at first it's nothing that feels like a big deal. It's just a little cough. But then it's that lingering cough that just doesn't get better. Or you're active and you're doing something like yard work or, you know, as we head into winter for those of us who live a little further north, you're shoveling the snow and it's just getting harder. You're not able to catch your breath. You're getting winded more easily. And instead of thinking, you know, I just had a bad day, I had a little bit of a cold, it's not getting better. It's slowly getting worse. This is, you know, these things can be very subtle when they start. 
So let's talk about asthma first. So asthma is a disease of airway muscles. So in this first slide, we see what a normal airway looks like. And this is the very ends of our airway. So if we think of our lungs, it's kind of like an upside down tree where the trunk of the tree is right here in our windpipe. And as it, the, our windpipe goes into our chest, it starts dividing into the branches, into the twigs, and then it ends with the leaves. And just like with trees, the leaves or in our lungs, the alveoli are where that air exchange takes place. And asthma tends to affect those very smallest twigs right before him. And at that point, the airways are these very thin little straws that are mostly made of muscle. And when they get aggravated, those muscles get tight. And we can see in the middle picture where that muscle is just tighter. There's not as much airway. And so the airway does, the air can't move out the way it should. And that triggers coughing and wheezing as we try and get the air in and out. But there's also the second part where as that, you know, as that irritation and aggravation continues, we get more inflammation and swelling, and then it's not so easy to get that airway to open back up. Different people get their asthma triggered by different things. Some people, it's infection. Other people, it's exercise. For some, it's allergies. It also say things like cold air or smoke, physical triggers can affect some people. There are plenty of treatments out there for asthma though. Out of all the manifestations we're gonna talk about, this is the one that is the most treatable and most easily diagnosed. So the big treatment is albuterol. It is a medicine that is inhaled that helps relax and open up those airways. So it's very good at relaxing and the problem, relaxing the muscles and relieving the symptoms. But there are lots of other inhaled medicines out there that can help them from happening in the first place, depending on how severe the asthma is. Bronchiectasis is much more difficult to treat. So this one is one that's important to find early. So what bronchiectasis is, is permanent enlargement of those airways. So they're supposed to be nice, thin, flexible tubes. In asthma, they get thick, they get thick and they get tight. In bronchiectasis, they get opened up bigger than they should, so they lose that flexibility. A lot of times in immune deficiency, it's because of recurrent infection. They cause permanent damage, they cause some scarring. But this can also happen in asthma, much less commonly. For symptoms, again, subtle at first, it's cough and you start coughing up mucus. With time, you can get shortness of breath and once things really progress, you can get clubbing. And so clubbing is where we get thickening of our nails right here at the angle where it usually divots in. Instead, it kind of balloons out. And the last symptom we can see is fatigue where you're just tired all the time. And you can see in this bottom right picture how with time that normal airway or normal bronchus goes from being that thin flexible tube to getting stretched out and we see how that damage occurs. The wall is destroyed and then we can't, the lungs tend to get stuck with mucus because the airway doesn't work the way it should to keep that mucus out. All right, so what do we do about it? So the big thing, you know, and this is still going to be part of anyone who has an immune deficiency, you got to look for an infection. That part is really important. But even if there's no infection present, you still have to try and keep those lungs as healthy as possible. And one of the big things is helping to get that mucus out of the lungs. We don't want the lungs full of pus. We don't want them full of mucus. So we got to get it out. But when your airways aren't working the way they should, a lot of times you need some help. So one of those helps is hypertonic saline. So this is a, a therapy that we put in a nebulizer and kind of breathe in where it really helps force that stuff out. Now it can be a little irritating to the lungs says it does cause a lot of cough, but it does work. Another device, and this is the device in the picture is a PEP device. So what you do is you breathe into the end of this and it, it gives a lot of resistance to to breathing out. And that resistance really gets that mucus up and moving. Now this one also takes some effort, but it's not nearly as irritating as hypertonic saline. So it's pretty well tolerated. The last is chest physiotherapy or CPT. 
And this is where we use some kind of percussion, either, you know, kind of pounding up on the lungs, or some people use a vest to really vibrate the lungs to get that mucus up and out. Sometimes we do pair that with albuterol, but that is another way of getting mucus up and out. Higher doses of immunoglobulin have also been shown to help with bronchiectasis. And this is where, you know, not everyone is on immunoglobulin replacement therapy, but a lot of people are. And that's where sometimes you need that dose personalization, where maybe, you know, your trough level, or your steady state level before your therapy of 800 isn't enough. Some people need to go higher to 1,000. And if you do have bronchiectasis, that is certainly something to consider. There are some studies out there that the macrolide antibiotics, so azithromycin or the ever famous z pack do have a bit of an anti-inflammatory effect when they're used three times a week. And so that is also a potential option to try and help with bronchiectasis. All right, so then our third kind of lung disease is interstitial lung disease. And this one is probably the hardest to understand because we're not talking about, um, oh, we're not talking about the airways, we're talking about the lung tissue in between the airways. So you can see in this CT scan, the holes, which are the airways, and those dark parts, which are the airways branching out. Now, all the lung in between those airways should be pretty much the same, you know, kind of grayish without a, with the little blobs of black in there. But in this one, we see a whole lot of white stuff all over the place. And that's what interstitial lung disease looks like. It's the lung tissue where the air exchange is taking place that gets inflamed. So symptoms with this, again, are really vague at first, but can start with just some cough or difficulty breathing. But as more and more lung gets affected, you start getting fatigue and you can get weight loss. The tricky thing for this one has, as with many things, uh, the, um, the non-infectious problems and immune deficiency. It's a problem with the immune system getting activated inappropriately. So not only are you not fighting infections, you're also attacking your lungs the way you shouldn't. And so the treatment is actually immune suppression. We want to shut down the immune response in the lungs and get it out of there, which can complicate things in other ways. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So what do we do? So, you know, even if you're symptom free, screening is a good idea particularly since, you know, I think a lot of people who are here for the forum today have an antibody deficiency, getting at least a baseline high resolution CT scan of the lungs at some point is a good idea. And if there's abnormalities, follow-up testing is reasonable. Now there are concerns with radiation exposure since we're also talking about cancer is another non-infectious concern. And so we definitely wanna limit this. There are some protocols that do limit radiation exposure and we definitely wanna spread out how often those CT scans are. So another way of doing that is functional lung testing. Spirometry is a breathing test that's used to look at asthma. It looks at how air flows in and out of our lungs. And if we want to look at, um, at uh, the potential for bronchiectasis and for interstitial lung disease, we can pair that spirometry with complete pulmonary function testing with diffusion capacity. And that's what this picture is. We call it the body box. And this and the, uh, what this does is uses kind of known amounts of air to figure out how big are your lungs? How is the air moving from your lungs? And how is that gas exchange taking place? And if there is still concern for infection, because again, infection doesn't always show up the way we expect it to. Sometimes a bronchoscopy, where they put the camera and the tube, they put you to sleep and they put the camera and the tube down your lung and they can do a washing and to see what's growing in the lung if there is potential for an infection there. Or if, you know, like that CT scan, there's all those white stuff there and we don't know what's there, sometimes a biopsy is needed. But, you know, those things aren't without risk. So it's always a good idea if you're having these problems to talk with your doctors, if the risk of doing these things is worth the benefit. 
All right, so let's switch gears and talk a little bit about what can happen in the stomach and the intestines. So gastrointestinal disease is not as common in lung disease, but can occur in up to 50% of immune deficient patients. And the three most common where we see it are antibody deficiencies or those B cell problems where, on, where you are in a, on immunoglobulin replacement therapy, neutrophil defects, so this will include chronic granulomatous disease and leukocyte adhesion deficiency, and also immune dysregulation. So the people who tend to have a lot of problems with their immune system getting overactivated and activated in ways we don't want to see it activate. The three most common things we see for immune in for gastrointestinal disease are inflammatory bowel disease, liver disease, and celiac disease. So we're going to cover those three today. So inflammatory bowel disease also goes by the name colitis. So and can look a lot like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. The most common symptoms start with diarrhea. So loose stools and a lot more bowel movements than usual. As it progresses, you can, you know, a lot of times at first, you can't see the blood in the bowel movements, but if you test, it's there. But as it progresses, you actually see bright red blood in those bowel movements. Abdominal pain is also very common. And, you know, the kind of abdominal pain can be all over the place. It's not necessarily in one part of your stomach or another, and it's, it can be crampy, it can be sharp. There's a lot of different things people can feel. Weight loss is also very common um, and generally speaking, unintentional. And as the diarrhea and weight loss pro progress, you also start to get more and more tired. So there are some tests that we can do that aren't so invasive, like stool testing or testing on your poop makes some people a little nervous to bring poop samples in, but it can be done. Um, there are some blood tests that we can do to look for inflammation or look for signs of blood loss. But the real thing we wanna do for diagnosis is a colonoscopy with a biopsy. So again, you get put to sleep and they put the camera in. So that bottom left side shows you what a normal intestine should look like. And the bottom right shows you what happens when you start to get polyps and when you start to get ulcerations. And so they can take a biopsy. So they take a piece of tissue out and they stick it under a microscope. So in the middle section, we can see what it should look like. It kind of looks like, um, like a bunch of little tendrils kind of going up and down and up and down and up and down. But as inflammatory bowel disease progresses, it just kind of shaves the top off of all of those. And we get a whole lot of white blood cells in there that shouldn't be there. And again, as is the treatment with a lot of non-infectious manifestations, the treatment is immune suppression, which makes you more susceptible to infections. So treatment really needs to be coordinated with a team of doctors. So anyone who's putting on you on immune suppression should know what they need to do to help keep you safe from infections. All right, so there are three main types of liver disease that we can see. Primary biliary cirrhosis, autoimmune hepatitis, and nodular regenerative hyperplasia. All of these actually have very similar symptoms to start. Again, fatigue and weight loss. They are so common on all of these and should never be ignored. But more specific to the liver, and the liver helps break down our bilirubin. And when it gets, starts to get affected, we start to get jaundice. And jaundice is when we turn a little bit yellow. So this picture here shows us normal on the left, jaundice on the right. A um, lot easier to see if you have a paler skin tone. For people who have darker skin tone, you really want to look more at the whites of the eyes because those will also start to turn yellow. You can also see some changes on the palms sometimes, which is a bit easier to see. Your pee can also change different color. It can start looking a bit brownish. We call it tea or cola colored urine at times. Your liver is located right under your, uh, right under your rib cage on the upper right. And so sometimes, especially if it starts to get enlarged and stretched, that can be painful and that will hurt right there under your ribs. If bilirubin starts to build up, it's also super itchy. And so some people just scratch and scratch and press scratch and can't stop scratching. 
And there's a lot of testing that can be done. And fortunately for once, a lot of the testing is not so invasive. We usually start with ultrasound, sometimes a CT scan. Blood work usually helps us out a lot with this, but if you know we're not sure, then sometimes we send, you know, radiologists can stick a needle in the liver and get a biopsy. We can look at it under the microscope and that can help us out too. These are pretty dangerous. And so we take them very seriously and they do again require treatment with immune suppression. But for this, the, you know, the risks, the risks are generally very much worth it because livers are important and replacing their function is not easy to do. All right, so celiac disease. So this I think is something that has probably reached, you know, the conscience of people, the conscious of people a little bit better. So celiac disease is when the immune system overreacting to gluten. And so the immune system thinks that the gluten is some kind of pathogen, some kind of invader. And when it encounters the intestines, the immune system gets deployed to the intestine where it attacks. So this picture here shows us again what the normal intestine looks like. And all of those little fingers that help us absorb our nutrients just get mowed down by the immune system. And that gives us a whole lot of abdominal pain. And it can be vague abdominal pain, sometimes sharp, sometimes crampy. Most people get diarrhea, not everyone, but I'd say most people get diarrhea because as those little fingers of the intestines go away, they really affect our ability to absorb nutrients. And when we can't absorb our nutrients, that can lead to weight loss and fatigue. Some people, and I would say this is much less common, but some people with celiac disease also get rashes. And these rashes can be itchy, they can be painful, they tend to really affect the lower legs more than any other place. So for testing for this, blood work is usually where most people start, you know, and it's not perfect, but it's pretty good unless you don't make IgA. And if you don't make your own IgA, the blood testing is much less reliable, which is unfortunate. The gold standard or, you know, the best way to diagnose technically is one of those endoscopies where they put you to sleep, they put in the camera and they take some samples and they look at it under the microscope. The trick with all of this diagnostics and blood work, though, is you have to be eating gluten or the testing is not going to be accurate. So if you cut gluten out of your diet and you feel better without it, do you really want to put it in, back in your diet to try and get an answer? Some people would say yes, some people would say no. But the treatment is lifelong gluten avoidance, which actually in the last few years has gotten a lot easier because there are many alternatives now to gluten out there. Another form of autoimmunity, so sorry, so let's talk about autoimmune disease. So this is where the immune system is no longer able to recognize what is self. So the immune system says, this isn't my body. This is something else. This must be an infection. So I am going to attack it. And there are four common places we see that. The first is arthritis. So this is where the immune system starts attacking our joints. And we can have small joints affected like in our fingers, our toes, our wrists. But large joints can also be affected like our hips, our shoulders, our knees. Typically, we see joint swelling and stiffness and pain, and that tends to be worst in the morning and improve as the day goes on and you start to move and loosen and use your hands or whichever joint happens to be affected. With time, though, that can cause permanent damage, so your joints just get eroded. And that can lead to permanent decreases in motion. And we can see here in these hands, a lot of those joints right around the knuckles and the wrists are so swollen that the hands just can't even straighten out the way they normally do. As with most autoimmune diseases, the treatment again is immune suppression, but the goal is to be as specific as possible to allow the rest of the immune system to work as normally as possible. All right, so the, another place that the immune system can attack our own bodies are our blood cells. 
So in the bone marrow, our, we make a few different things. We make red blood cells to co uh, carry oxygen around our bodies. We make platelets that help us stop bleeding. And we make a whole lot of different kinds of white blood cells that help us with, um, with fighting infections. And any of those can get attacked by our own immune system. The most common kind is autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So this is where our immune system attacks our red blood cells. Because our red blood cells carry that bilirubin that the liver's got to break down, one of the most common things we see is jaundice, especially if it's a lot of um, anemia all at once. So you can get that yellowing to the skin, yellowing to the eyes. And because those red blood cells are carrying oxygen around without oxygen, we get tired. So energy levels tend to go down. For autoimmune thrombocytopenia, if we don't have platelets, we start bleeding. So this is an, oh, I got a nosebleed and it took me five minutes to stop it. It's, I got a nosebleed and it went going for hours and I pinched my nose and it kept going anyway. Bruising, but not bruising where we expect it. You know, it's normal to get bruising over bony parts of our body. They're less protected, more common on our legs, on our feet, on our arms. But we're talking about bruising in places where you didn't really bump or you've got some protection to it, like on our back or our buttocks. Petechiae are another sign of low platelets. And that's what we see in these pictures here. All those little red dots are petechiae. So if you run your finger over them, they don't get paler, they don't blanch, which is what we see with most rashes. And that's how we tell the difference between those. The other places you can see this besides from, aside from nosebleeds are like if you're brushing your teeth and your gums start bleeding, but you don't have gum disease. That's another place to think about that. Last is autoimmune neutropenia. So our neutrophils are one kind of blood cell that helps keep us safe when we first get sick. And if those blood cells count, neutrophil counts drop enough, we just start getting fevers. We can also get infections. The neutrophils are also really important for keeping the surfaces of our mucosa intact. So the lining of our mouth, for example. And when it goes down, sometimes we can get ulcers or sores in our mouth. Fortunately, the cytopenias are really easy to diagnose. All it takes is a quick blood count to make sure it's not a problem. So this is something if you're concerned, definitely talk to your doctor. Not invasive testing on this one. Skin diseases are another really common type of autoimmune disease. So the first is vitiligo, and this is where our immune system targets the cells that make melanin, which is what gives us our skin pigment. And as they attack, we just lose the pigment. If, you know, it's much more dramatic if you have darker pigmented skin, if you have lighter pigmented skin and you're not sure, because a lot of things can cause decreased pigment, like scarring. You know, it, most things will tan a little bit in the sun. And if you have patches that don't tan at all, that's more likely to be vitiligo. Very hard to treat, but there are some treatments that can be attempted. Next up is psoriasis. And this is a picture of psoriasis on an elbow. And the outer side of our elbows and the fronts of our knees are more likely to get affected than any other part of our body, but it can happen anywhere. You get this kind of thick scaly patch that has this kind of silveriness to it. And if you pick up the end, sometimes you see a little bit of blood under there. Can be treated. There are topical options, which we try and use first because they don't cause other side effects. But there are some, you know, stronger medicines that can be given if that's not enough. Alopecia is where we lose hair. And so we're not talking about normal balding as we get older. We're talking about random patches of hair loss. And this can just be patchy. It can affect all of the hair. Again, another problem that is very difficult to treat and generally does not respond well to most treatments. The last one I'd like to talk about under autoimmunity is endocrine disorder. So our endocrine system is the part of our body that makes hormones. And when our hormones get thrown off, it can affect different parts depending on what's affected. So our pancreas makes insulin, which is what regulates our blood sugar. When the pancreas gets attacked, we end up with what is essentially type 1 diabetes or insulin-dependent diabetes. So people who are having problems with their pancreas 
have symptoms of diabetes where you're peeing a lot and you're drinking a lot of water to try and keep up with it. Energy and weight loss are also common. Uh, and this is also pretty easily diagnosed. Thyroid has, uh, regulates our me uh, metabolism and our energy. So if our thyroid is attacked, a couple different things can happen. At first, you can have almost a high release of thyroid hormones. So you get more energy, you start losing weight, you're a little kind of jittery and hyper. But as your thyroid gland gets destroyed, you flip to the other side where your thyroid is no longer making hormone and your energy drops down and you start getting cold really easily and you start gaining weight and you just can't lose it. Parathyroid disease is a lot less common, but that can affect our calcium balance. And calcium, um, when it's off, can affect our muscles. It can cause kidney stones. It can cause constipation. It can make us feel a little off. Our adrenal gland can also be attacked. This one is a lot less common, but it affects our salt and mineral balance. And so when we get stressed, our adrenal gland starts making stress steroids that help us maintain our salt and mineral balance. When it can't do that, when we get stressed, so when we get sick, for example, we can't maintain our blood pressure in the face of stress. And so if you know, this is always something to consider if when you get sick, you end up getting really sick all of a sudden and you know the and it's not really the kind of infections that you would expect that to happen with we can also get you know, end up secondary problems with adrenal glands for people who have to you go on steroids a lot because it does suppress our own adrenal function All right, so another thing that can happen both with infections and without infections is granulomatous disease so when we get infection, our white blood cells can sometimes come together and try and wall it off. And that's what a granuloma is. It is an organized collection of white blood cells. So here in the picture, we can see this really clear kind of glob. Lots of cells around it, but the middle is kind of contained. So, you know, it's natural to make granulomas when you're dealing with an infection like tuberculosis, but eventually your body kind of deals with the infection in the middle and they should go away. This can also happen in autoimmune disease. Granulomas can happen anywhere in the body and the symptoms really depend on where that is. So, for, so if you get a granuloma in, the lymph, in lymph nodes, they can just get really, really big. And they, you know, they don't really feel tender. They don't hurt when you poke them, but they're big and they're getting kind of hard. They can also cause, cause symptoms of blockage. So here I have a couple pictures of the intestines and the stomach. And this is what happens if you get granulomas going all the way around that are just blocking it off. So you get symptoms if it's in the intestines of a bowel obstruction where it hurts and you're vomiting and you can't, you know, food's not passing through. Uh, on the right, we have contrast going through a stomach and then all of a sudden it's blocked off because there's a granuloma going all the way around the outlet of the stomach. And so food is just not passing through. If this is occurring in the lungs and there's a lot of space in the lungs, you can just get a cough. And granulomas don't always show up on x-ray, but they will show up on a CT scan, which is why getting those, you know, once in a while, not often, but once in a long while may be helpful, especially if you've had a persistent cough that is not going away. So, you know, it, but again, they could show up anywhere. They can show up in the skin. They can show up in the liver. They could even show up in the brain. And, that, you know, if it's showing up in your brain, one of the common scenarios that can occur are seizures which is why most people who are having new seizures get some kind of brain scan to make sure there is nothing going on in the brain. So a lot of times for diagnosis, we need a biopsy. You know, it's, again, this also happens in infection. So the only way to really, really know it's an infection, because again, it's walled off, is to go and get a piece of it and see, is there an infection or not? Um, for treatment, it depends on what your immune deficiency is and what's causing your granuloma. 
for some people, they need to be removed surgically. For other people, immune suppression is the way to go, but trying again to keep it as specific as possible so the normal immune function is not changed. And for some people, uh, you know, a bone marrow transplant to give a whole new immune system is what has to happen. But that is a very extreme option. And so again, is something that really needs to be discussed with your doctor. So kind of akin to granul granulomatous disease is lymphoproliferation. So instead of a well-organized condition, you can, um, a group of blood cells that are walling something off. In lymphoproliferation, you get a whole bunch of lymphocytes. So this is a kind of white blood cell, like our B cells and our T cells. And instead, you know, and they are usually really tightly regulated for how many we make, when we make them, and again, when we don't need them and they go away. Lymphocytes live in our lymph nodes and our spleen. So when we have too many of them, those things tend to get big and you can feel them. There's a picture here of one in the neck. And you know, they should get bigger and smaller as we get sick, but when it's lymphoproliferation, they get big and they stay big. Sometimes you can also get fevers, you can get weight loss, and sometimes you get symptoms based on location. So similar to what happens in granulomas, they can cause some blockage, they can cause some obstruction. And for testing, when we see a lot of lymph nodes, we also worry about cancer. So blood work is important. Imaging to see how many lymph nodes or how big the spleen is, is important. And sometimes we do need to get biopsies. Treatment depends on why the lymphoproliferation is happening. And that can be a really hard question to answer. You know, sometimes there's a viral infection that needs special treatment. Sometimes we need better regulation of the immune system. Sometimes it's an infection that just won't go away. So sometimes it's surgery. Sometimes it's chemotherapy, sometimes it's immune suppression. And this can be a really hard answer to get to. All right, so last but not least, malignancy. So when your immune system has trouble recognizing what's for what is self and what's not self, it can also sometimes miss malignancy. And sometimes it's due to infections that people are predisposed to because of their immune deficiency in the first place. And I would say Epstein-Barr virus or EBV, which is the virus that causes mono, is a big one here. Sometimes it's because the immune system just isn't doing the surveillance it needs to do. It's exhausted, it's doing as much of it can, as it can, and that's part of the problem. Sometimes it's a problem that leads that is part of your initial immune deficiency. So if your lymphocytes just aren't developing and functioning the way they should, you can get more problems with development. Sometimes those changes in development can lead to cancer. The most common types we see are lymphoma. So both Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And the big symptom there, again, are big lymph nodes, big spleen, weight loss, and fatigue. Leukemia is another one which presents similarly. Carcinoma is also a problem. So skin is a big one here. And so keeping your skin safe from sun is important. So use of sunscreen, use of physical blockers, hats, things like that. Oral cancer can also occur. And so making sure you're seeing a dentist or that your doctor is regularly checking your mouth is important. Stomach cancer can also occur too. The symptoms, again, you know, the big ones that are shared among all of these, fevers, fatigue, weight loss, and night sweats. And so we're not talking about someone who just kind of gets hot at night and gets a little sweaty. We're talking about someone who's sweating so much they need to change their pajamas at night or they need to change their sheets at night. Blood work is usually the best place to start again here, and then sometimes a biopsy is needed. Um, again, sometimes the immune system gets confused, and so the allergic disease is, all, is also more common in more forms of immune, defici in immune deficiency. So eczema is where we get dry, itchy skin, and probably itchy is the big symptom here. And a lot of times, very treatable, regular skin care, especially bathing and frequent application of lotion is the key. Allergic rhinitis or hay fever or seasonal allergies where, you know, certain seasons our noses get runny or sneezy or itchy or stuffy. Also pretty readily treated with, you know, antihistamines or nasal sprays. Drug allergies is also a big problem, you know, and especially for immune deficiency where antibiotics are more frequently used. 
And this one really does require evaluation because you really need to know, was this reaction a dangerous one where I can't have this antibiotic again? And if I can't have this one, which other ones can I also not have? Or was this not a big da dangerous one? And this is one where I could try the antibiotic again. And sometimes there's only one antibiotic that will work for the infection you have. And so there are ways, if you are allergic to an antibiotic, but you need that antibiotic, there are ways to kind of temporarily make it so you don't react to that medication. You know, it's risky. And so people don't like to do it, but it can be done if absolutely needed. So what are the complications? You know, again, most of these treatments involve immune suppression. And anytime you suppress the immune system, there is going to be a higher risk of infection. And if that's going to be the case, sometimes you might need additional medicines like prophylaxis to add on during that treatment. A lot of times, you know, delays in diagnosis are common. So the symptoms aren't what people would expect or they very slowly progress. So just because you do a test one day and it's normal doesn't mean that in another six months it might change. So if you're having symptoms and you do the testing and everything looks fine, don't ignore it, keep an eye on things. A lot of times the tests rely on having a normal immune response. And if you have an immune deficiency and your immune system doesn't respond the way it should, the standard testing sometimes isn't reliable. Some of the testing relies on checking antibodies. If you are on immunoglobulin replacement therapy, they're not checking your own antibodies, they're checking the antibodies present in your product. You know, and with a lot of these, especially I would say the liver disease, there is an increased risk of death. So it is really important to pay attention to new symptoms. And if you're asking me which three are the big ones, I would say fe unexplained fevers, unexplained weight loss, and fatigue. If you are having those, get them checked out. Just because everything is fine the first time, if your symptoms continue, keep going back. Keep bringing it up. Skin rashes are also a warning sign and should be checked out. Any trouble breathing, especially if it's progressive. If you see any bright red blood in your poops and it's not from constipation, that also deserves to get checked out. And if you have swollen lymph nodes, now I'm not talking about the swollen lymph nodes that get a little big and go back down. Swollen lymph nodes that get big, don't hurt, and don't go back down. And when you feel your lymph nodes, they should kind of feel a little rubbery. They should be easy to move around. If they're not, that's also something concerning. If you have new if you have new symptoms and they're not going away, you gotta see your doctor. And for some of these, regular screening can lead to early detection. So not just your immunologist, a primary care physician who stays on top of those regular healthcare screenings is also really valuable here. Oh, and thank you everyone. I enjoyed being here with you this evening. And I'll turn it back over to Kathy. Thank you so much, Dr. Neighbor. As a reminder to participants, if you have questions, you can still submit them to IDF forums in the chat box. And then in just a couple minutes, we will have Dr. Neighbor answer as many of those questions as possible. Now, before we continue, though, I would like to invite Eric Pluckhorn from Octopharma for a quick word from our sponsor. Hi, everybody. I'm Eric Pluckhorn from Octopharma, and I'm joined tonight with uh, or by uh, Laurel Cherwin, who's one of our clinical nurse educators. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody out in the breakout rooms after the Q&A session. And uh, just a quick thanks again to the IDF for putting on these educational forums, making sure that everybody stays connected during the times of the pandemic. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. And now we will switch over to the Q&A session. And Dr. Niebuhr, we have quite a few questions here and we will get through as, as many as possible. Okay, the first question is, nodules were found in my lungs before my CVID diagnosis. Um, can you talk about um, 
nodules and the CVI are nodules. And if they are related to bronchiectasis or interstitial lung disease. There you go. Okay. Um, the answer is yes. So those nodules can be a lot of different things. Again, the big two, th three things we worry about, infection, lymphoproliferation, um, granulomas disease and malignancy. And, but with common variable immune deficiency, the big two we worry, you know, we worry about granulomatous and lymphocytic interstitial lung disease, which can cause bronchiectasis too, because of the blocks. You know, and so the big thing here and the difficult thing is getting a biopsy because not all of those nodules, you know, a lot of times those nodules are not in easy places to get to. And there is some considerable risk when you're talking about trying to get a piece of lung out to figure out what's going on because that can lead to problems, you know, it can lead to some real complications like collapsed lungs and things like that. But the answer I think is important if it's possible, because if you're seeing granulomas, if there's no infection, but you're getting granulomas and you're getting lymphoproliferation in the lung, that does take immune suppression to clear out. And it's important to do it to maintain the health of your lung. You know, if interstitial lung disease and granulomatous disease and lymphoproliferative disease in the lung goes unchecked, that can destroy your lungs over time. And lung transplant is not something that most people would like to go through if there are alternative therapies. Now, immune suppression for, and the short term for this is GLILD, granulomatous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease, which can have some features of bronchiectasis to it. There's a couple different parts of the immune system that all need to get suppressed. And so a lot of times they use monoclonal antibodies to kind of zap out certain populations of blood cells that are maybe in the lungs and then do some kind of longer term therapy. And I would say there are probably some new trials looking at more specific medicines that maybe cause less immune suppression and maybe a little, a little safer to use. But if you have nodules in your lungs, that is certainly, and you have CVID, I would say the two are almost certainly related and do require treatment. But the, you know, the hard thing is getting a biopsy to prove that that's what it is. But if you have lung nodules and you have immune deficiency, trying to figure out a way to do that is important because it will help determine your treatment. Thank you. Next question. Is there any concern about long-term use of budesonide for managing GI symptoms? So I'm going to assume we're talking about swallowed budesonide, which is a steroid. You know, and when you're talking about steroids, they do have a lot of side effects when used systemically. So we're talking about you know, how much makes it from wherever you're putting the steroid, where you're inhaling it or swallowing it or, you know, putting on the skin, how much gets to the bloodstream? Because when steroids get to the bloodstream, they affect us head to toe. And that can, you know, that means weight gain, hard on our bones, hard on our muscles, can cause cataracts, can cause glaucoma, can cause mood shifts, can affect growth. Um, but a lot of those, you know, what's the dose? How high? And it does suppress our immune system to some degree. You know, it's, it stops our kind of qualms down our lymphocytes. It also makes our neutrophils function a little, not quite as well. So it's always a good idea to minimize the dose. So the least amount possible and also the least amount that makes it into the bloodstream. But definitely there are some problems that can be caused with the immune system. And so I would say some monitoring whenever you're on steroids is important. But sometimes you have to use steroids for these non-infectious problems because they are the safest therapy. So I would say if you have to be on steroids, the lowest dose is the best dose that is still effective. And then you have to be screening for the consequences. So looking at calcium, looking at vitamin D, 
eye screenings, weight checks. If you're a child and still growing, checking how, if you're getting taller the way you should, you know, blood sugar checks. All of those are very important because as side effects occur, if you catch them early, there are ways to treat them and minimize them. But honestly, for a lot of these problems we talked about, steroids are still some of like budesonide, like prednisone, methylprednisone, there are a ton of them out there. But for a lot of these problems, they are still the first medicine we turn to because they work quickly and they help us sometimes transition to something else or sometimes get to a lower dose that is not so likely to cause side effects. I have RA and my hip hurts. My doctor wants to do an x-ray, but I'm not sure what that will show. How do x-rays show damage from RA? So, you know, when you're looking at a joint, you are right that an MRI is good to show the joint itself. But if you have RA, it can start eroding into the bone. And that's where we see that chronic damage. And so an x-ray is actually a really great place to start. You can see a couple different views of the hips and you can't move people so easily when you're doing an MRI. So you can see a little bit of how the joint lines up. You know, for hip, it's a ball and socket joint. So we want to see that that hip so that the, you know, that kind of bone from the leg is fitting nice and tight into that socket. And in RA, you can start to see changes in how those two fit together. And if you're doing an x-ray, you can say, okay, move your leg this way. Now move your leg this way. And you can get a few different views of that. So an x-ray is definitely a good place to start and can help you decide if you need more imaging and what kinds of imaging you should do from there. Are there any concerns or causes for very high platelet levels in patients with PI? So platelets are again made to help us stop bleeding. But you know, they get also get some signals to be made when we have inflammation. So when we have inflammation for any reason, it sets off a few signals in our liver and in our bones to make more platelets. So, you know, it's not so much that the platelets are causing a problem. It's just the platelets are, if they're high and persistently high, can be a sign that there's inflammation of some sort in the body somewhere else. So, and this is again, where sometimes things don't show up the way we expect them. So if you have some kind of abnormality like that, but you don't have any other symptoms right now, you don't ignore it. But sometimes doing all this extra testing doesn't show anything. Sometimes we have to wait for it, which is very frustrating, I fully admit, but sometimes we have to wait for to figure out, okay, the platelets are high. We think it means something else, but we need to wait to see for some more hints to figure out where to look. Please discuss the relationship between primary immunodeficiency and gastric malignancies. So the immune system has a lot of monitoring to do, you know, with those cell, with figuring out what is a healthy cell, what is a not healthy cell. And so if we're talking about parts of the body that get a little bit more stressed, skin is certainly one, it's exposed to sun, um, we do other things that are maybe not so helpful for our skin. But, you know, gastric carcinoma is similar because of all the acid production from the stomach. That's rough on the stomach, especially if you don't maintain the lining of the stomach the way you should. And the immune system is very important for that as well. So our stomach usually has a nice thick layer of mucus all the way around it to protect us from our stomach acid. And we need that stomach acid for digestion. But when those barriers break down, sometimes that exposes our stomach to more acid than it should. And that can cause damage over time. And when your immune system isn't quite right, that can cause a predisposed to gastric carcinoma, which in all fairness is not a very common kind of carcinoma, but does seem to be a bit more common in immune deficiency. Again, the common symptoms are, are pain, fatigue, and weight loss. 
Does an inhaler help bring up mucus if you are having trouble coughing it up? It depends. You know, so an inhaler alone probably isn't enough. You probably need an inhaler and then followed by one of those other treatments we talked about that help bring the mucus up. So some people will use albuterol to make sure their airways is, is, are as open as they get, and then use a PEP device or a, you know, the percussive therapy or the hypertonic saline to mobilize the mucus and get it out now that the airways are as open as they can be. But I wouldn't think that an inhaler all on its own would be enough to do that. Would polycythemia vera in an 11 year old with CVID and celiac fall under the cytopenias category? So that's actually the opposite where you're having too much. So not, so when I say cytopenias, that means low counts. Polycythemia vera is the opposite when the counts are too high, similar to um, whoever brought up the platelets being too high. But I would say it goes along with common variable immune deficiency, as in there's a lot of problems with regulation that occur. And the immune system is certainly one of those places that's supposed to help the bone marrow know when to stop. Can granulomas in the intestines be seen on an ultrasound? They're really hard to pick up. So, you know, a lot of those images I showed you don't show the granuloma. You know, they show contrast, which kind of shows up highlighted on the x-rays. And then you see where the contrast isn't passing the way it should. You know, so normally you see the whole outline of the intestine all the way through. And what you're seeing is, are these places of narrowing where you have the granulomas pushing on the inside, uh, like from the outside into the middle. I know, and honestly, most imaging is gonna, especially if we're talking about intestinal granulomas are gonna have a really hard time picking it up because sometimes they're not that big. And the intestines, you know, there's a whole lot of feet of intestines in our body. And so sometimes really the answer are those endoscopies because they can actually see where are there, you know, where is that mucus lining not quite looking right? Where are we seeing things poke in? Um, but again, that depends on the location, but they, I completely agree with intestinal granulomas, they can be very difficult to locate. How can we get immune suppression drugs when we need IVIG? The, the hard thing is it's sometimes you just have to do it because some of these things really can affect life expectancy. So, you know, the goal is to try and be as specific as possible. So for example, for the granulomatous and lymphocytic interstitial lung disease that can happen in common variable immune deficiency. One of the very common treatments is using rituximab, which kills off B cells. Now B cells make immunoglobulin. So guess what? If you're already on immunoglobulin, maybe we just up your dose and then it's not so bad. And we put you on some, maybe some other medications that prevent some other related infections. You know, it's not so much that it's a great option to go on immune suppression when you already have problems with infections, when you're already on medicines to try and boost your immune function. It's honestly because not going on immune suppression is riskier than going on it. And so with any drug, I mean, same goes for the steroids. It's about picking the most specific medication you can at the lowest dose you can to cause the least amount of side effects. And sometimes you have a really great and specific option and sometimes you don't. And, you know, that's where this intersection of immune deficiency and these other kinds of manifestations get really difficult. They would say as we develop, you know, there's this emerging idea of precision medicine, where if you know exactly where things have gone wrong and you have a medicine that acts right at that place, 
you know, so it's like changing the train switch. So instead of this track, we're going to go down this track. We can get that ability to change the way the immune system has gone wrong without causing so many side effects. And that's something we're honestly just seeing emerge right now. And that's where we really need to do our best to understand what is the problem here? Which cells are the ones that are misbehaving and where are they getting the wrong signals or misunderstanding what they're supposed to be doing? Can a person have malignancies if they have normal blood work, such as a normal CBC? Depends on the malignancy. You know, so for leukemia, no. You're not going to have leukemia and have normal blood counts. For lymphoma, you know, usually you see something there, but usually you're also seeing that those lymph nodes are big and not getting smaller. Um, for the other malignancies, yeah, you can have normal blood counts and have a malignancy. But the blood malignancies are the ones that are most likely to be caught on blood counts. The other things you can sometimes see for the other malignancies is that that hemoglobin, which affects your red blood cells, is dropping. Sometimes you can get a little low or a little anemic when there is a hidden malignancy. But I would say those blood counts are only really going to be super reliable for leukemia and they will help with lymphoma. Is HLH syndrome considered a blood disorder? Uh, it is a lot of things. You know, more than anything else, I would call it immune dysregulation. I, in all fairness, I did leave it out of this talk because I think it is something that is really difficult to explain to other doctors. <laughs> but, you know, for, for everyone on this forum's understanding, HLH is basically unregulated immune system activation, where the immune system gets turned on for one reason or another. And there are a lot of things that can turn it on. And it just goes wild attacking everything. You know, and the big cells that seem to be at the heart of this are T cells and macrophages. And, you know, they attack the bone marrow, they attack the liver, they cause massive inflammation throughout the body. And sometimes that can be overwhelming. So I would, I would really consider it more immune dysregulation than anything else, but there's a lot of different things that can set it off. For some people, it's infection. For some people, it's autoimmune disease. For other people, it's, it's just that it's, the problem is you're missing a control component of our, your immune system. And sometimes that button gets hit and there is no off button to shut it off. But I, I would certainly consider HLH in, in the realm of non-infectious manifestations, though it can be triggered by infection, I would say EBV is the big culprit again there. You briefly mentioned mouth lesions and low blood counts. What part of the blood count would lead to mouth sores? What should we be looking for? So your neutrophils are going to be the blood cells that are responsible for maintaining healthy mucosa. Uh, so the linings. So that includes our gums, our mouth, our intestines, all the way down. And when neutrophils get low, and we're talking really low, you can get those ulcers. Uh, usually, you know, on blood counts, this is one of those things that gets flagged in red. And so it's not one of those things that are missed. When we do blood counts, we can do a CDC, which kind of just looks at the white blood cells as a whole. But for looking at neutrophils and looking at lymphocytes too, we need what's called a differential, where we break down the different kinds of white blood cells that there are. You know, and so for a neutrophil count less than 0 0.5, we tend to worry that those mouth sores could be due to low neutrophil counts. Above that, you know, I, I would say that we don't see neutrophil problems causing mouth sores. Could ACTH low normal at 15.6 um, be a sign that autoimmune adrenal disease is developing? Also have potassium deficiency, muscle pain, thirst. Ah, so that is so bad. 
so the specific testing for adrenal deficiency, I am not so well versed in because, you know, I, in all fairness, I am a pediatric specialist and those ranges change a lot. So this is something where I would follow up with your endocrinologist about because they're going to be the expert in interpreting that test. But again, sometimes things progress with time. So again, you do the test. It's not, it's fine. It's normal or it's borderline, but you still have the symptoms and the symptoms aren't going away. Is it always reasonable to say, hey, you said this test was normal, but you know, it looks borderline to me and I'm still having problems. Could we repeat the test? You know, you have to be willing to bring your concerns to your doctor and be heard. But specifically for that question, I can't speak to how to interpret an ACTH stim test. But if it's borderline and you're having symptoms, I would go back and say, hey, can we look at this again? Does primary immunodeficiency and mast cell activation disorder occur together frequently? I would, I would imagine no, because you know, I mean, it, it could, but I would imagine no, because the triggers for the two are very different. Could you be unlucky enough to have two separate problems? Yeah, some people are unlucky. But for most of the mast cell activation disorders, I would say it tends to be a separate problem. Can you talk about lymph node pain without swelling? Um, this happens in my ears and my neck. And is there something that can cause this? So most lymph nodes are pretty tiny, especially if we're talking about the lymph nodes behind the ears. So when anything that is kind of enclosed in a little bit of a capsule gets stretched, it hurts. And so even if you don't feel your lymph nodes, if they're stretching or enlarging because you're making more lymphocytes, because your immune system thinks they're needed, um, it can cause some pain. And painful lymph nodes are actually a sign that it's probably more of an infection or something like that rather than malignancy. Um, but our lymph nodes, especially for ears and neck, can get activated for all kinds of things. So if we have something going on with our scalp, like irritation or... Um, or bad dandruff or cradle cap for kids, you can get big lymph nodes. If you're having eczema troubles, if you're having allergies, if you're getting swimmer's ears, sinus stuff, any of that can make those lymph nodes get bigger. And because a lot of the ones you mentioned tend to be small, you feel it when they get big. You know, so painful lymph nodes, generally for most of us, is a more of a concern for some kind of um, sudden or short-lived kind of trigger rather than the things that, you know, rather than cancer. Thank you. Now we're at the end of our Q&A time and I'd like to thank everyone for their questions and also thank you so much Dr. Niebuhr for taking time out of your busy life and volunteering to be here with us tonight. It is only because of our amazing volunteer presenters like you, Dr. Niebuhr, that we're able to provide these IDF forums. Now, for those of you whose questions weren't answered tonight, um, we will be um, following up with you. And Dr. Niebuhr, we might send some of those to you to be um, answered, but um, thank you. Thank you so much for being here, answering questions, great presentation, and thank you everybody for submitting your great questions. Now, at this time, I would like to invite Sean McCabe to say a few words. Thank you, Kathy. Always tough to follow up these amazing presentations and the, the gauntlet of your Q&A. It's unbelievable. Dr. Niebuhr, phenomenal, phenomenal and informative uh, uh, session. So thank you very much. And, and thank you for being a hero to the community, uh, particularly connecting and engaging in the moments that we find ourselves, obviously the virtual nature of the world. Um, and a sincere thanks to the IDF for standing up the 39th one of these uh, since this all began. Absolutely incredible, the innovation, the connectivity, and uh, most importantly, the informative nature that you helped assist the community through such an amazing time and such a difficult time. 
Um, obviously, uh, with case counts rising, just thoughts and uh, you know consideration for everyone out there to stay safe. Um, unbelievable, we're finding ourselves back into another wave of this, but hopefully uh, the last. And uh, so, thoughts and prayers, and, and and hopefully be safe for everyone. Just a very brief introduction to myself, uh, Takeda. I, I have the honor and the privilege of leading the immune deficiency franchise at Takeda. Uh, we're, we're honored and, and proud to represent the brands uh, Gamma Guard, Hycubia, and Cubitru. Uh, I've said it before on many of these, we're not here to talk about brands, we're here to listen, and most importantly, uh, relay services that we offer to the community that doesn't matter what brand you're on. I think Christine or Christy at, uh, at our peer company, Griffel, said it best, provided that you guys are uh, safe and healthy, that's the priority. Uh, so to that end, Dana Flathammer is joining from our community support team to talk about uh, a lot of the service and offerings that we provide to the community uh, and, and via my IG source. So uh, Dana will be in the breakouts here in the next few minutes, and uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you again. Thank you, Sean. And we do look forward to hearing from all of our sponsors in just a couple minutes. Now, finally, before we head into our virtual exhibit hall, I would like to encourage everyone to please connect with us online, visit our website to access the many resources IDF has to offer, such as publications, online support groups, updates on upcoming events, and so much more. And you can also connect with IDF on social media to keep up to date with our community. So thank you once again to all of our sponsors for today's forum. Now, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We look forward to seeing you next time. Be safe and take care. Good night. <laughs>